Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Looks like we have a full house this morning, so there is some more seating over here. Um, we might have to squeeze in a little bit. Uh, make yourself comfortable wherever. I'll invite you to join and stand as we sing Death Was Arrested. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now. Life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now, life began. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made me new now, life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. You have made me new now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now life begins with you. We're free. Oh, we're free. Good morning. 
Living Loon Mountain Ministry. How's everybody this morning? This is a much bigger crowd than I was expecting. Uh, today, I don't know how your day's going, but uh, my day started with my radiator letting go and all my coolant coming out into my garage. And, um, and so, you know, actually I think happened last night, but I, you know, looked at it more this morning. And I'll be honest with you, <clears throat> getting three kids to three different mountains and dealing with a broken radiator, I really didn't want to come to work this morning. <laughs> and then I came in and I realized, oh, my family's here. And you guys met me with hugs and high fives and a good cup of coffee. And, uh, and isn't that what church is about, right? We are not a museum. You don't have to fake it here. Please let us know how is it going in your life? What's going on? You know, we cannot hide from the Lord. God knows everything about us. And we want to be a church that is caring and loving wherever you are at. And so if you're online, shoot us an email, whatever, come have a cup of coffee. If you're here, if you just need a big old hug, or maybe you're not a hugger and you just need a hello, you know, let me know because I'll hug you and then later be like, oops. So um, anyway, great to have you guys here uh, this morning. Uh, A couple things. One, I know last week um, we told you that it was an incredible not-so-silent auction. It was even more incredible than we thought because when we went and we counted, last week we had a tally of 18,000, but once we counted everything, we had a tally of over 23,000 raised. So you guys are incredible. Thank you for all the donations. Thank you for moving chairs, tables, set up, tear down, watching kids, helping with the church service. Um, so thank you about all that. Thank you so much for all that prayed for Farah that morning. We stopped and prayed for Farah that morning, little one. I think she's running around here somewhere. I got a Farah hug already. There she is over there. Um, more kiddos coming. Uh, if you get to see the Schroders, go hug the Schroders. I saw they were here this morning. Randy had a boy. Way to go, Randy! I knew that beard was going to pay off someday. So they're really, really excited to have a little baby boy named Shepard. So that's cool. So go give all the kids over there a high five and a hug. And uh, what's really cool is our sister ski resort, or uh, Sugarloaf Ministry, turned 40 this weekend. So they were having a big old bash up there. And so I actually went online and I made a little video from all of you guys wishing them a happy 40th. They had a big party last night. And uh, we had a little video from Loon Mountain Ministry that went up there and wished them. Without Sugarloaf Ministry, there isn't a Loon Mountain Ministry. Because Skip and Joyce started that one in 1982 and then came back here in 1990 and started this one. So you guys are part of something much bigger than just this, and we love reminding you of that. God, we love you. We thank you so much for this space and time. We thank you so much, God, that you use even us, even me this morning, someone who is frustrated at work and frustrated at my car, frustrated at situations, even me, uh, you can use me, and you can use all of us in here, Lord, if we're willing and we put our faith, hope, and love, and trust in you. Thank you for coffee and music. Thank you for newborn babies. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful family that's gathered in a thrift and coffee shop. Thank you that you are a God that is outside the boxes that we make and love to put you in. Thank you that you don't stay in those boxes, but you are above and beyond anything that we could ever think or imagine. So today, God, we're going to join you with whatever you're doing. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to pray. We're going to look at your word, uh, all in an effort and hopes to see and feel and find and hang out with the presence of God that is here this morning. To your name we pray. Amen. Let no one caught in sin remain inside the lie of inward shame, but fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who showed great love and bled for us freely. For us, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. 
Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. church proclaim sing it together christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave christ is risen from the dead we are one with him again come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave oh death where is your sting oh hell where is your victory oh church come stand in the light the glory of god has defeated the night sing it oh death where is your sting oh hell where is your victory oh church come stand in the light our god is not dead he's alive he's alive christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come awake, come awake. Come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. Trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake. Come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come awake. Come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Man, as we approach Easter, I absolutely love uh, these songs as we reflect on the resurrection and what that means for us who believe. You know, oh, death. Where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Um, we are more than conquerors, Romans tells us. Um, and when, when we think about that, I was, we were studying in our missional community group, um, Romans 8, a couple weeks ago. And for the longest time, I was like, what does that even mean, we are more than conquerors? And we were reflecting on that. And, you know, one of the things that, that we heard um, through actually a, a Right Now Media study uh, of Romans by J.D. Greer was that being more than conquerors is that God not only defeated death and, and Satan and sin, he used those very things for his own purposes. And so he not only conquered, but he uh, made a public spectacle of them. And uh, we know that at the cross and, and at, the re- at the resurrection, um, we are more than conquerors. So next we're going to sing, His Mercy is More. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. 
Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. beautiful morning it is to celebrate your mercy and that it is more than what we can imagine um, or comprehend. Um, but Lord, help us remember that that says something about us, that we need that kind of mercy. Uh, we are all here on equal ground as sinners not uh, worthy of your grace, but you offered it to us through Jesus on the cross. We thank you and today we praise you for what you have done through dying on the cross for us. Uh, we lift your name high, and uh, we do it together collectively. So we thank you for that out of a small little town in the, in the mountains of New Hampshire. We love you, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. All right. Thank you guys for all being here. As Marcus mentioned, we're continuing to be blown away by the generosity through the Not So Silent Auction. Um, one other kind of key note, we got, we got an opportunity with a youth group this past week to celebrate because of that uh, over 23,000, um, 1,200 of that was directly to the youth group, which was literally like doubled our budget for the year. So we threw a big old like ice cream party and the kids had a blast and um, we just want to say thank you. Like what a, what a cool blessing um, and uh, we want to give God the glory for that. So, um, so yeah, high five God, you're awesome. Um, I'm going to direct your attention to the back of your bulletins uh, or the screens there um, just with some announcements. Uh, the big one coming up, uh, three weeks, we're three weeks away from Easter. Um, crazy how the winter season flies by so fast here in the mountains. But a couple things to note about the Easter sunrise service. Obviously, it's, it's April 9th. We are doing the sunrise service as usual. We are uh, 
kind of like fine tuning all the details, so stay tuned for that. But essentially, it'll be the service will either be at like six or six fifteen in the morning um, that Sunday. Uh, if you're here, essentially, we're trying to like get some volunteers though. It takes a lot to do that service between greeters, um, handing out bulletins, different stuff like that, um, as well as set up at the top uh, to get the sound system going and everything. If you're interested in volunteering, um, get a hold of Drew. Um, you can find Drew's email, drew at loonmtnministry.com, or you can chat with him after. Um, but we need volunteers. Uh, the volunteers will be getting there at 5 a.m. Uh, at Loon uh, to kind of coordinate where uh, everybody will be going. Also, on Easter sunrise morning, um, this is not at sunrise, we'll have a brunch at 9 a.m. here at the coffee shop. If you are uh, willing to bring some food, um, Trish is coordinating that, so uh, chat with Trish um, about that, and then we'll do kind of that unplugged service. We we did one of those on Christmas that just kind of like, we talked about it being like a coffee house, just really family vibe um, kind of service, so without sound systems, without any of the glitz and glamour, just us hanging out, celebrating Jesus together. So that is on Easter. One other thing, this isn't actually up there or on your bulletins, but um, on March 30th, there is a tagging party uh, here at Encore. That is, um, that is a Thursday, Thursday, March 30th. Um, the last thing uh, I want to bring your attention to, because it is like today is the last day to get registered, is the 811 u Shred Weekend, formerly known as SFC Camp. Like I said, t tonight, like at midnight, we close down registration to anyone um, uh, who's coming. But um, we're excited. That is next weekend, kind of Friday night all the way through Sunday evening. Always a really fun experience, a, f a full send kind of weekend, um, you know, all day Saturday. Uh, but it is a blast. We've got like skis and snowboards to give away. We've got lots of fun prizes. Um, and, uh, and you know, our goal with these, these kind of youth camps that we do, whether it's this one or the mountain bike one we do in the summer, is, um, is that we take kids uh, on their next step um, in their faith and their walk with Jesus and their next step in skiing and snowboarding or in mountain biking. Um, because if you know me, you know I love to do those things. Um, so, uh, yeah. That's, uh, that is ending tonight. If you have questions about uh, what that weekend looks like, come and chat with me. Um, we also want to make sure that if you can come, that you come. Um, you know, if it's a financial burden to have to come, let's chat. We have some scholarships available. Um, we we want to get as many kids there as possible um, to get to see what it looks like to be the light of Jesus on the mountain. Um, other than that, of course, there's lots of opportunities to get involved midweek. Um, we've got different small groups, Bible studies, missional communities that meet throughout the week. There's a nice little board over here um, that shows some details about the different groups. You'll see on the back of your bulletins um, some of the different groups as well. Um, if you have questions, just come and ask um, about where these different groups meet and what times and all that good stuff. Uh, right now, media is still on here. We're still going through this series on James, and we've been directing people to a series uh, on Right Now Media by Francis Chan on the book of James. We'd continue to encourage you to do that. You guys all have that as a resource for free um, through Loon Mount Ministry. So if you have questions about how to get signed up, it's on the bulletin here. Um, but also, there are some other ways to, to get access to that through Loon Mount Ministries kind of domain, I guess. Um, if you want to support us, we've got the support box there. You can give online, all that good stuff. But we thank you guys for being here and supporting us in that way. With that said, I'm going to release the kiddos. We're going to have our Sunday school, uh, age four to eight, making their way this way. There's a whole bunch of kids. It's awesome. I love it. Job security. Uh, nursery, back this way. Um, and uh, we'll get back to it. One more song. I'll invite you to stand as we're going to sing Man of Sorrows. You know, I love this song. Uh, it talks about the, the silence of Christ, right? Silent as he stood accused. And I, I, I love 
thinking about how Jesus had every ability and right to speak on, on behalf of himself, to, to come to his own defense, right? But he chose not to. He chose to be silent so that he could stand before the Father and speak on our defense and speak on our behalf. So we're going to sing about that in Man of Sorrows. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood up. Salvation, where your love. 
have you remain standing, and I'll ask Christine to come on up and lead us in this morning's scripture reading. Good morning. The reading is from James 2, 1 through 13, and join me in reading this. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said, you must not commit adultery, also said, you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will judge by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Here ends the reading. All right. You may be seated. I love this church. Um, I was taking someone's coffee order, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, i got to go preach. And they're probably just like, what is going on? Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, Thanks for for loving me and uh, loving us well. I I really appreciate that about church. Um, I was visiting with a pastor friend. Uh, and uh, I don't think a lot, there's, there, I, I don't want to take it for granted. I think there's a lot of uh, churches and congregations that don't love their staff well. And uh, I feel like you guys love us well. So thank you. You let us be us, you know, and our prayer is that we let you be you, you know, that it's God's uh, work in us, you know. So anyway, welcome back to the book of James. We took a little break last week. It was really nice for those that were here um, to have my dad preach last week. That was really awesome of him to come down and uh, preach. Uh, wasn't his main accent pretty? <clears throat> his main accent pretty awesome. I loved hearing his main accent. I love it when dad preaches. Like I told you last week, I go right back to our old church, and our old church had this huge grandfather clock on the wall, you know. And uh, during prayer meeting, I would just listen to that thing tick on Wednesday nights, wondering how much longer it is till we get out of here. uh, But um, it was cool to have him here, and I'm so thankful for his faithfulness, and he loves you guys a lot. Um, Yesterday, they had a big celebration up in our town. I didn't get to go to it because we were here working a ski race yesterday, Uh, but my grandfather would have been 100 yesterday. So about 60 to 80 people gathered at church yesterday up there to celebrate my grandfather. And I think it's pretty cool, Jim, because you like, like, would have been pretty close to my grandfather. <laughs> he would have been in high school when you were in grade school, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah, so they, they went to celebrate my grandfather, which is pretty cool. And I had corned beef, I had corned beef and cabbage on Friday in my grandfather's honor, so his favorite meal. All right, so we're going to get back into the book of James. So you read James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. If you want to grab your bulletin, you can hit it there, or if you want to grab uh, your electronic device, or if you have the good old printed Word of God, um, pretty cool. Uh, So James chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 
Just a reminder of a quick history on the book of James. This is not James, uh, the brother of John, uh, one of the original disciples. Uh, they call him the sons of Zebedee. If you watch the chosen, you know, it's pretty cool to see how they play up that sons of Zebedee. And Peter gets jealous that Jesus calls them the sons of sons of thunder, which is kind of cool. If you haven't been watching the chosen, you totally should. It's absolutely incredible and very, very, very well done. Um, this is not that James. This is James, the brother of Jesus. And uh, I think it's so cool that we talked about before that James doesn't name drop, right? James doesn't use his, uh, you know, relation to Jesus to be like, yo, you should listen to me. I am the brother of the Messiah. That's right. I am the brother, the earthly brother of the son of God. He doesn't say that. He actually comes out in beautiful hum humility and says, James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that this brother has had a heart change because how many brothers, you got siblings, how many brothers would introduce themselves and say, hello, I am so-and-so, the servant of my brother. <laughs> that's not, that. no, no, that's not how that works. Right, Nancy, you got two boys. Has any one of them introduced themselves as a servant of the other? Oh, oh no, oh, no, <laughs> yep. And uh, so you know that James has had an incredible encounter with the Son of God in a different way than just his biological brother. An encounter and in a belief and a faith and a changing of his heart so much, so much, that he would go and be so bold and be so hum uh, uh, humble as to say, I am a servant of this Jesus and not name drop and be like, you should listen to me. I am the earthly brother of Jesus. I would be tempted to do that. I, you know, I would be tempted because if you were to do that, it would, be, it would kind of bring me cred, right? Bring me street cred. Make me feel awesome. Be like, yeah, yeah, dude, can I get into this place? I'm, you know, I'm the brother of Jesus, yo. I can tell you some cool stories, you know. Um, you want to know what he did when he was 12? I can tell you, you know. That's what all of us are guessing. Everyone wants to know what Jesus did between, between when he was born and when he was 30. You know, and uh, James whole held the, had that, you know. And what I think is incredible, James didn't write that. James could have literally been insanely famous by writing a book, right, about all the things Jesus did between the ages of 10 and 30. That would, he could have, and that would have made him insanely famous. But instead, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, because the reality that his earthly brother was the Son of God, James put his faith, hope, and love in Jesus, and it changed his whole perspective. And that's where we get this book. And that also happens to you and me. See, when we put our faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ, and we are filled by the Holy Spirit, it changes everything. And you see this with James, the brother of Jesus. Because I do believe 100%, without the Holy Spirit, without James' true faith in his brother as the Son of God... James, James writes a book for his own benefit and not for people's benefit 2,000 years later. Not for the benefit of the 12 tribes scattered across. That's what it opens up. This is a letter to the 12 tribes. Now, this reads differently than a letter from Paul. Paul addresses a very specific church and usually a very specific problem within that church. Whereas in James hits a whole people group. And what's beautiful about James is James was born in a good, you know, Jewish home. And in a good Jewish home, if you watch The uh, Chosen, there's a couple times in different episodes in The Chosen where all of a sudden all the disciples start quoting the Old Testament together. You'll watch, all of a sudden one of them will start quoting something, and then before you know it, four or five or six of them join in and start quoting it. There's this beautiful scene where the disciples are quoting something from the Old Testament. I think Philip kicks them off, and the two women that are traveling with them, Mary Magdalene, I forget the other girl, girl's name, look at each other and go, don't you wish we could do that? Don't you want to do that? And they go and they begin to start reading the Torah for themselves, which was a no-no in that day. And they begin memorizing, which is super cool. So why do I tell you that story? James came from that home, right? Grade school for James 
wouldn't have been, you know, arithmetic and, you know, multiplication and, and story problems. James Elementary School would have been memorizing the books of the Bible of the Old Testament. And one of them would have been Proverbs. And what you can tell about James' writing is that from childhood, James has been a huge fan of Proverbs. Because once James gets through chapter 1, which is written very much like a letter to the 12 tribes scattered across the, 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 the nation, once he gets into chapter 2 and onward, it reads really kind of similar, similarly, did I say that right? I don't know, to the book of Proverbs. To the book of Proverbs. So a couple things to know. James was a huge fan of Proverbs. So that's why they call this the New Testament book of wisdom. That's why we chose it after we got done the book of wisdoms in the Old Testament. And then two, James was a huge fan of his brother's sermon on the Mount. Let me say that one more time. James was a huge fan of his brother's, Jesus, sermon on the Mount. That is another indicator that James was filled by the Holy Spirit And was humbled. How many brothers do you know that say, man, I love my brother's speech. I love it when he gives a good riveting speech and tells us how to live. I love it when my brother tells me how to live. Has anyone ever said that in the history of Everness? No. I I know that my sister's not like, boy, I love it when my brother tells me how to live. Makes me want to get up and do what he says. No, but when you read the book of James, he quotes his brother so many times and the quotes come right out of the Sermon on the Mount. So let's jump in and look at this. See, the Sermon on the Mount talks a lot about how to look different than the world. If you remember the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used a lot of language. You've heard it said. But I say, and then he gives a really difficult thing. And a lot of it is to say to we as Christians, us as Christians, those that were listening, right, then that were considered God believers at that time, that would be us. We'd be very similar to that, right? Now, the difference is they were learning, trying to figure out that this was the Messiah. We know that because of history and because of the books that are written in the Bible, But they were big-time God followers. That's the crowd he was talking to. He was talking to very churched people, right? And so James is also talking to very churched people. And Jesus talks a lot in the Sermon on the Mount how you and I, as churched people, as God believers, should look different than those who are not God believers, those who are not church attenders, That's the Sermon on the Mount, bulk of it, is how you and I are to look different. So James, today, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, a lot is talking about how we should operate, look different than that of the world. Now, I have in my notes, I wrote this. You and I, me included, we the church, we the God followers of 2023, us the chosen watchers, you know, us, the, you know, church attenders, the, the, the worship music listeners, we love, we love to show how much we look different than the world on the outside. We love that. I mean, included. We love to say how we look different, right? We love to say how we uphold rules and the rest of the world does not fill in the blank we like to usually check off the easy ones like i am not a hard drug user right or i don't listen to explicit material in music right or i skip forward in the show that i want to watch that has a sex scene makes me feel better about myself you know than the other people that are watching this 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 very famous show you know and um we like that that makes us feel different on the outside. But James is just like his brother, Jesus, because he listened, he paid attention on the Sermon on the Mount. And he also would have known this verse. Remember me telling you that um, James grew up in Hebrew school? 
and he knew the Old Testament back and forward, he would have known this verse. Write this verse down. 1 Samuel verses 16 and 7. Here's what the Lord says. He says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, God does not give two flying flips about how Marcus looks different on the outside from the rest of the world. Really doesn't. God cares about the inside. Okay, so what's the inside? James is putting his finger in these verses about the inside. And it starts off with the word favoritism. It also talks about judgmentalism. But if you think about it, where does favoritism and where does judgmentalism start in me? between the ears the mind so james right now is talking about the battle of the mind and the bible has a lot to say about the mind we look back at one of james's favorite books proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says this for as a person As a person thinks in their heart, so they are. Let me say this one more time. For as a person thinks in their heart, so they are. You've heard it said, you are what you eat. Right? Have you heard that? Well, I would be a big old pizza and chicken wings. I'd be a walking, loaded pizza with some chicken wings. And a bunch of blue cheese following me. Right? If you are what you eat. But the Bible says you are what you think. And we had a good laugh when I said that I'm a big old pizza with chicken wings being followed by blue cheese. But if I am what I think, and I was to share to you the things that go through my mind, When I'm not on display, performing in front of you, I am what I think might not be as fun or funny a conversation. Again, we as Christians, we love to look different on the outside. That's it. We even rank each other. And we rank the world, and we, we love it. But looking different on the inside is what Jesus and what the Bible is actually looking for. This is why our thought life is so important. If the book of Proverbs says that you are what you think, that's very important. And it's important to take note. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 6. I'm pretty sure you've heard me say this before, but I have heard the most, the wisest Christian thinkers of all time, most of them agree that if, I, I, I kind of envision them playing this game, right? If you have all these really, really high end Christian thinkers, what kind of game would they play? And have you ever played the game like, hey, If you could only have one type of food on an island for the rest of your life, what type of food would it be? Have you ever played that game? Or like if you could only have one album, one musical album on an island the rest of your life, what album would that be? Have you ever played that game? Well, I, I envision the greatest Christian thinkers of all time saying, hey, if you could only have one chapter of the Bible, what would it be? And what's interesting is I've heard a lot of great Christian thinkers say this. It would be Romans chapter 8. So if you are not familiar with Romans chapter 8, I would highly suggest going home tonight and flipping to Romans chapter 8 and read the entire chapter. 
and then maybe read it again and again and again. Romans chapter 8 is a very powerful and incredible piece of the Bible. Romans chapter 8 verses 5 and 6 says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh always ends in death. But to set the mind on the Spirit ends in life and peace. James had his mind set on the things of the Spirit. Why do we know that? Because if I was James, and I have my mind set a lot on the things of the flesh, I would have wrote a book about being the brother of Jesus that made me very famous and went on a huge book tour, staying in incredible hotels, having awesome meals, and traveling the world on my book tour. I would have. James write this little book where he doesn't even claim to be the brother of Jesus. He says that he is his servant. And then goes on to talk about the difficult teachings of his brother and how you and I and him, including James, should live that way. James had set his mind on the things of the Spirit. And if that wasn't enough, if it wasn't enough that James, that James wrote a book without claiming to be the brother of Jesus and covering the teachings, the hard teachings of his brother, James was willing to be murdered for putting his faith, hope, and love in his brother. James had his mind set on the things of the Spirit. Now, if you're like me, you'd be like, well, it was probably easy for him to do that, okay? He got to see Jesus do all his miracles. He saw Jesus raised from the dead. He put his, you know, arms around the risen Jesus. You know, it, it'd be easy for him. Uh, hey, guys, we have the entire New Testament written in five different types of however it makes you feel to read it. You have it on audio. You have it on video. You have 18 billion apps so that it will read the scriptures to you. You have unbelievable content, books upon books upon books upon books upon books about people who love Jesus. You have <clears throat> this free country where we're gathered right now and no one's pointing any weapon at us for gathering and saying the name of Jesus. Okay, we also have all of the same benefits James had. But I too struggle to put that kind of faith that James had in Jesus, that it would cause him to write a book, not about himself, and not getting any of the benefits, and actually, he didn't get a book tour, he didn't get a comfy bed at a hotel, he didn't get a great speaking engagement with awesome buffet afterwards, he was murdered. Quite a good book tour, huh? That's who is writing this book. So when you read this book, think about that. These pages have James' blood on them. Doesn't that make you want to read it a little bit more? Doesn't that make you want to sit and soak it in a little bit more? It would cost James his life to believe in his brother? It's crazy. Romans chapter 8. What an incredible chapter. A couple verses. Things of, the earth, things of earth versus things of the Spirit. Colossians 3, 2 echoes this. This is Paul. He says, set your minds on things above and not things that are here and on this earth. Isaiah, chapter 26, verse 3. The person who keeps his mind on Christ and trusts in you will find perfect peace. Let me say that again. The person who keeps their mind on God, steadfast on Christ, and trusts in him, will find perfect peace. The Bible has a lot to say about the mind. And I find it quite interesting that the book of Romans talks about peace. The book of Isaiah talks about peace when it comes to the mind. 
I don't know about you, but as a Christian, a lot of times, and poor Naomi and Wyatt were on the brunt end of this last night, I want to give you a piece of my mind instead of having peace of mind. And Naomi can testify, I did not have much peace of mind last night while I was giving her a piece of my mind to chew on. <laughs> right? Oh, morning. Good to, good to see you. Awesome. Good to see you. It's one of my friends from first date at Loon. Hope she enjoyed her coffee. I love this church. Where was I? Oh, yeah. And that's my problem. And when I have my mind on things of the earth, on things of this world and this nature, I end up giving people a piece of my mind. And that is not good or valuable. But when I have my mind on things above, or as Paul says in Romans, on things of the Spirit. Well, what are the things of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, goodness, right? Those are the things of the Spirit, right? The book of Philippians says, when I have my, you know, when I'm thinking about whatever is of good reproach, that's kind of a weird word, but whatever is of good, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good for me and for others, when I have my mind on that, that's the things of the Spirit. Spirit. And Paul says this leads to peace and to life. And I've noticed in my life that when I have my things on earthly things, you get a piece of my mind. I remember Miss Piggy in the Muppets Christmas Carol. If you have not seen the Muppets Christmas Carol, I would highly recommend it next time Christmas comes around. But she's the wife of Bob Cratchit, who works for Scrooge. And Scrooge shows up at Bob Cratchit's house on Christmas Day. And he puts on that face at first, because we all know that Scrooge has changed in the night by being visited by the three spirits. But Bob doesn't know this, and his wife doesn't know this. So... Scrooge shows up to do this thing where he's like, Bob Cratchit, why were you not in work today? After already giving him the day off. But he was doing the normal Scrooge. They don't know he's been changed. And I love this scene. Miss Piggy throws Kermit out of the way, who's Bob Cratchit. And she goes, she goes, Mr. Ebenezer, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind and I hope you choke on it. And that's what happens when we have our minds set on earthly things. We give people and ourselves a piece of our mind, and we end up choking on it, and they end up choking on it. No one enjoys it. And guess what, Christian, Marcus? We look just like the world when we do it. Just like them. So, Marcus, if the only thing setting me apart from the world is where I am between 9 and noon on Sunday morning, and what radio station my radio is dialed into, or what podcast I listen to, or the fact that I don't swear, or I don't drink too much, or I don't fill in all of the fun rules that we've made, to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. If that's the only thing that's separating me from the world, that's not what God is looking at. God is looking at my mind and my heart being renewed, like Romans chapter 12 said, being renewed daily so that I might know my dad's will for me and his will for the world is what it says. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. That I might daily... Well, I've only made it halfway through my notes, and I'm pretty sure. um, I think I'm going to end with this. I wrote some of these things down when it comes to favoritism. When we show favoritism, our trust and our hope is in something else. 
put it this way. Favoritism, favoritism, you might think that you are showing it to, like this is how we as Christians love to justify it and we love to spin it, is that, oh, I, I'm being kind to someone. I'm being kind to someone. I'm being nice to somebody. But if it is favoritism, it's because you want something in return. You want the social elevation, the social status elevation, because you have deemed them, you have judged them as high socially. So you want to hitch your wagon to them. Or maybe it's someone who has wealth or perceived wealth. And you want to hitch their, your wagon to them because they might buy you dinner at a nice place that's above your budget. Or they might invite you to their house on an ocean in an island and bring you with them. Or they might make you feel really good about yourself because they ask awesome questions and you, they find you interesting and you find them interesting. See, favoritism is not love. It's love with expectations. Favoritism is love with expectations. And love with expectations is not love. And that's what I was struggling with last night when I came home and was super frustrated. I had an expectation last night. And I love how God did this to me. But my expectation was completely blown because the people that I wanted to show favoritism to didn't even show up to the social gathering that I did. So I wasn't even able to. And instead, I, you know, was there um, with a lot of children under the age of 10. And we all know how well Marcus does with a lot of children under the age of 10. There must have been at least five of them to every one adult in this establishment. It was crazy. And the individuals that I really wanted to hang out with and get to know and talk to, not that I didn't want to get to know anybody that was there, but I had an expectation of who I wanted to talk to and what I wanted to talk about. Do you find yourself grumpy? Follow the string of the grumpiness. And most often, it's because your expectation was not met. And when it comes to social gatherings like church, it's often because those who you want to show favoritism to, A, didn't show up, or B, didn't talk to you. We don't like to be as bold in the church to show favoritism to the rich people, right? This one talks about the rich people. That, that, that everyone can see. We see what you're doing there. But we do love to give favoritism to the socially fun those that we want to talk to. And you see it at church. We're no different than the world. If all of a sudden we needed to go somewhere and there was four different 15 passenger vans out there, you would quickly find out that there is a social hierarchy in this room. And who you want to go in a car with and who you do not want to go in a car with based upon your social desire. And that, my friend, is favoritism. And me and you are guilty. <laughs> guilty. And that's what James is talking about. Isn't it incredible how James can reach his finger 2,000 years through the power of the Holy Spirit and put it right on Marcus's heart? It's like, Oh, that's the Holy Spirit. That's how you know the Holy Spirit wrote this. Because it's still convicting to me in 2023. There are not very many pieces of the literature that can do that. Why? Because this is breathed and living by the Holy Spirit. And so we as Christians need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. 
to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Because if we put four, five, 15 passenger vans out here, and the cool kids all gotten one, and then we were all left to defend for the rest of ourselves for the other three, actually, the Bible says that leads to death. It does. Because have you ever been that person that's tried to manipulate a situation? Maybe you're, you tried to manipulate a family gathering. Maybe you tried to manipulate a church morning. What typically happens? You usually end up grumpy, correct? And those that you're around end up being grumpy because you were grumpy. That's leading to death. And sadly, in homes, that leads to people not coming for Thanksgiving anymore. Or Christmas anymore. Or gathering anymore. That is death. That is relational death. And favoritism and expectations are the root And James is telling me, and James is telling you, that's how we should be different from the world. That's how we should be different. Because when we don't show favoritism, and we love even as we have been loved by God, it leads to life. I don't know about you, church. I individually would like life and peace. And I'd love for our church to continue in on a journey of finding love and peace. And it's hard because it comes with getting rid of favoritism and getting rid of judgmentalism and loving as we first loved. Now, that does not be, mean being a doormat. I don't have a personality that becomes a doormat. But there are some of you in here that have personalities where you just become a doormat. That's not it. Okay, Heidi? That's not it. I mean, sorry. Um, that's not it. You don't become a doormat. But I need this sermon. Because <laughs> if you've hung around me, I've never been a doormat. I need to be told to not judge. I need to be told to not show favoritism. And maybe you do too. Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for this space and time. We thank you that your word is true 2,000 years later. We thank you, Lord, that you can use us, uh, musicians, and coffee, and me, broken people. We confess, we come before you, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to renew our minds on the things above, to forget the things of of earth. And we just think about that old hymn. And, And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. Help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus. And that our spirits, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, will be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, and self control. And that we would not show favoritism. Help us to confess. Because we are prone to fall. And I am prone to show favoritism. Especially when the stakes are high and someone that I really think is awesome happens to show up. Help us not to show favoritism. To the name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more song. Re- resurrecting. that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the Savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we Thank you.
fear that held us now gives way to him who is our peace his final breath upon the cross is now alive in me your name your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king your name your that God did not show favoritism when he sent his son. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Uh, and so let us, as we have been loved by God and as God loves the world, let us also love one another without favoritism, without bias. 
Thank you for joining us this morning uh, for worship. We pray that uh, you have a blessed week. Now go to love, serve, and enjoy the Lord.